But I do think there should be a larger conversation in the public in the public domain about transparency. I mean, it's troubling to me that this, the General Assembly exempts itself from open records and open meetings. Um, we pass the law that say we don't have to follow it. And so that, I think, sets the tenor of how we're going to operate. Uh, I'm not as disturbed by 386 as some are. Uh, I'm, I'm more disturbed by what happened yesterday in 469 and 447, where duly elected members of the General Assembly got no notice and a bill was both introduced and the bill came out in less than 10 minutes, um, counting on the fact that people didn't know the meeting was happening, especially when the subject of the meeting was about free speech. <laughs> I find that to be both hypocritical and, and deeply problematic. But I, I understand Mr. Pettis' concerns. I understand the public concerns. But part of my job is to balance those concerns against the other concerns. And if there are ways to stop other bills or raise other issues, I have to temper how angry I am with what's coming next on the calendar. <coughs> yes, sir. What kind of revenue increase is going to take to get a pay raise for educators <coughs> Speaking from my vantage point or from theirs? <laughs> Georgia has a structural deficit that we continue to ignore. We need about $1.5 billion to put ourselves where we should be. I mean, it's as though we built a house for about 5.5 million people, but 9.8 million people live here now. And we're still charging the same rent. In fact, we reduced the rent because we decided we didn't want any extra money. Georgia needs more money. We're not going to take care of our obligations. We're not going to do COLAs. We're not going to do pay increases until we acknowledge that it actually takes more money to run the state. Uh, we have won the run. We won the race to the bottom of being the. We are the state, other than South Dakota, and I think because we just don't have as many moose. We have <laughs> the lowest per capita spending of any state in the nation. We are the ninth largest state. It is bad policy. It is bad fiscal policy for us not to take care of the people who built the state and continue to make the state run. I think until we acknowledge the economic situation, which is that we need to take in more revenue, and that you can take in more revenue and not violate you know, either the Bible or some holy grail sent down by Grover Norquist. Um, <laughs> because if you are going to be a smart business, you have to invest properly. And that means not only investing in your infrastructure, but investing in your workforce. And so I believe that in order for us to get there, we're either going to have to get a windfall or we're going to have to put Democrats back in charge because we're willing to say what we think need to happen. That is that we need to take in more revenue in the state of Georgia. Yes? Um, can you talk about the relationship between Metro Atlanta and the rest of the state? I mean, the fact that you are the House Minority Leader, you have developed a um, fairly cordial relationship with the governor and the speaker. Can you talk about where um, the urban versus rural relationship stands and what can be done to bring the state together with more of a common vision? I think those are two separate questions. I'll, okay. I'll take them separately. Um, I've, I've been very pleased to work with both the speaker and the, the governor. <coughs> As I said earlier, part of my job and part of being not only the minority leader, but being in the minority is you realize that you're not going to get what you want, um, but that you should work to get what you can. Um, and I'm, I'm by nature not that angry. Uh, anger takes a lot of energy. I'm just entirely too lazy for that. Um, so I do my best to work with others. Uh, but it's also about being honest and, and being forthright about where we stand. And so, and I've been pleased that, that to date I've had that kind of relationship with or the governor. We don't always agree. Um, in fact, we, we can vehemently disagree, but we try to do that disagreement with respect and with honesty, and so I, I've been pleased that that's worked so far. Um, I think that the challenge for Georgia is that we are no longer divided by urban and rural. We now have urban, rural, exurban, suburban, and all of those are competing issues. And if you look at the dynamic down to capital right now, um, if it was simply urban versus rural, HB 87 never would have passed. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the immigration bill is that was very much a South Georgia rural versus a North Georgia suburban set of issues. Um, the, the challenge is less about urban versus rural than it is about making certain that the very specific interests that are in play have voices that have power behind them. And right now, most of the power has shifted to the Northeast, so it's bypassed the metro Atlanta area and gone to North Georgia. All counties, the most powerful county in the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, 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 that area is, has the <coughs> speaker, lieutenant governor, and the governor are all from North Georgia. And so that power dynamic has shifted. Uh, I think the opportunities for conversation 
and the opportunities to bring the state together come when we recognize that we are no longer, again, the state of five million people where you could do a fall line and above the fall line you won, below the fall line you lost. Uh, now we have a responsibility to be more integrated not only in our politics but in our conversations about these politics. Uh, I think that I look forward to seeing what the new maps do in terms of electing folks from those districts because the power of those voices will really determine the tenor of how we, how we move forward. I've spent more time outside of Georgia. My, my chief of staff, at, um, Ashley Robinson, has driven with me. We've been to Lewisi, Osceola, Scriven. Uh, I've been to Troop County. I can't remember exactly where that was. But we've <laughs> traveled the state. And, and what, I, what, what I think is most informative is that no one really cares if you're from Atlanta. They care about what you're going to do for them when you get back there. Uh, and I think that's the dynamic and the political reality that we have to accept and, and really work towards. Um, I was watching lawmakers last night. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was tough. But um, I, I saw, I don't remember if it's a representative or Senator English talking about a settlement of $900 million or almost a billion dollars from the mortgage fraud and that Governor Deal wanted to put it in this economic development fund. Who gets to decide how it's then spent after you guys go home this Never. week? Georgia has a very strong, we, we are a very strong, we have a very strong governor in Georgia. And so once we set the budget, it is up to his head of economic development and the governor to decide how those funds are allocated if we don't um, line item and say where it has to be directed. With the um, tobacco settlement money, it looks like that was $1.4 billion that went into the One Georgia Authority. And when I look at the website of the One Georgia Authority, it looks like Governor Deal and Casey Cagle control the whole thing. So let, let, let's, let me clarify. So what okay. happens with each of these settlements, it comes yes. to the state. Um, the tobacco settlement, the $1.5 billion, we get it paid out year over year. Mm -hmm. So some of it gets allocated. What we do with the money is we allocate it to cover lots of different issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've done that with, when we did that with the mm -hmm. tobacco settlement. So some of it went to One Georgia, but okay. some of it went to cover other things. We put some uh -huh. of it in the health care. We put some of it in other parts of the budget. Okay. Uh, because the money doesn't come with constraints, we can put it where we want it. Okay. Uh, and so with the tobacco, with the um, settlements coming down from mortgage fraud, it's $813 million mm -hmm. for the state of Georgia. I think it's $112 million that's being put into the reserve fund and economic development funds. Mm -hmm. uh, that's to plug some holes that we've got. I disagree with that choice. I think it's a bad decision given how high our, our foreclosure rate is. Uh, but it is going to be voted once the budget is voted on today. That becomes the law. Now there was a bill introduced by Jay Powell, HB 811, which would have said that if money was designated for a certain purpose, it could not be reallocated without reducing the amount of money that was used in successive years. So that over five years, if we don't learn our lesson, the money disappears. Uh, that was gutted by the Senate, and so it doesn't work. Oh. Um, we'll get some version of it, but it gives the General Assembly still the imprimatur to do what we want. And when I say we, I do not mean me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm probably um, a real minority in this uh, building because we, as you went down, ticked off the list of bills, it sounded kind of contentious, and I think you mischaracterized some of the, the intensive bill, and it played well to the audience. But some of the stuff that <coughs> you said was kind of factually wrong. Can you give me an example? Like with the, I mean, okay, my firm belief, I don't believe in abortion for any reason, but if you give give me the rape and incest thing, I went to Rain's website. Uh, the rape, uh, the abortions that happen as a, as a part of that is less than 14% out of what, one and a half million abortions a year. And <coughs> they're, other than being, you know, as our president said, punished with baby for not counting your days, whatever. That's, that's no, you know, I thought that's kind of where I believe we're, you know, we're not, we're not hating women, you know, we're not, you know, we're not endorsing mistakes, bad judgment or anything like that, but most, I would hear the red herring of the, you know, the uh, health of the woman and all this other stuff, but most women are pretty healthy and are it's just inconvenient. I mean, and that's well borne out by most of us. Okay, and, and I appreciate that. So HB 954 only deals with abortions that are performed after 20 weeks. The problem with that is that the minority of abortions performed at that stage. 
Um, typically, those abortions happen for three reasons. One is spontaneous abortion, meaning that the child, the fetus, has some anomaly in its <coughs> so the miscarriage. Um, but more likely, you have medically necessary abortions because the um, it will be a lethal birth defect is how it's characterized. Uh, a fetus will develop, but without a brain stem, without a heart, without kidneys, without lungs, or a fetus can be diagnosed through genetic testing that cannot be performed until 18 to 24 weeks that identifies their genetic markers that will, that will create genetic diseases that upon birth will lead to that fetus passing away within two to three weeks or two to three days. This will not allow a doctor, in fact, three doctors, under current law, it takes three doctors to say that these abortions can be, can be performed. This bill will say that those three doctors no longer have medical standing to make that choice. And it says that the only way that those choices can be made is if the life of the woman is actually in danger, not that there's some physical impairment, but it has to be permanent physical impairment, meaning that sepsis will set in and her organs will shut down, or she will die. Those are the only exceptions currently made. So I, I don't see how what I've said is inaccurate. My issue is that it does not provide for any exceptions for incest or rape. So let's assume that you are a 15-year-old who is not aware of her body, or 14-year-old, who is insufficiently aware of her body's <coughs> dynamic, has been the victim of incest, and you don't find out until you've hit the 23rd week, somebody notices that you're actually pregnant, you're taken to a doctor, you are emotionally incapable of maintaining this child, plus you now are going through the trauma of, of having to admit what's happened. There is no provision in this bill that will allow you or your guardian to make a decision about whether or not you are physically fit or emotionally fit to carry this child to term. My issue is not with whether you're pro-abortion or, or anti-abortion. This bill removes any medical capacity or any physical impairment beyond that that threatens the life of the mother or is a physically damaging impairment. So you can be pro-abortion. In fact, 17 of the people who voted against this bill have voted in favor of other anti-abortion bills. But they said no because they either had personal experience or they understood that this is a vast overreach of law that actually undermines the ability of women to make choices and, more importantly, interferes with the relationship between a woman and her doctor. That's my issue with this bill, and I don't understand how that would be factually incorrect. I'm very honest about characterizing these things from my vantage point, but I do my level best, and in fact, sitting out there, I write all these things down because I have members <coughs> of my community who disagree with me all the time, and I want them to know why they're angry instead of just being mad. So I, I don't. I try not to. I was just no, no, no. It sounded contentious. You know, the way you were doing it was kind of snarky, and I thought. It's your point of view. No, well, no, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's, it's, it's his right to have that. Point. No, I, you, you have. I am. I, I speak from my point of view, but I try to use facts. But I cannot divorce myself from the emotion of the issues that I discuss. My job as a legislator is to have a point of view. My job as a leader is to express that point of view. Um, I'm absolutely certain that they will likely invite someone who will completely and totally disagree with me. And if you have any questions, I can tell you who they are. But <laughs> no, but my, my nature is to be slightly sarcastic and smart aleck. But but the facts that I offer are, you can check anything I say, and I've written it down just in case you disagree with me, and I, I invite you to read about it. I think Suzanne is about to make me sit down, so thank you all for having me.